So thank you for coming to my infomercial. Uh, so I was frustrated listening to debates over money, uh, especially on Twitter, or as it's now called, X, <laughs> where people advocating Bitcoin would differentiate it from the gold standard and completely misunderstand the gold standard. Uh, people defending the gold standard, of which there are fewer, would misrepresent Bitcoin, uh, even when, in a way, they're, they have to be allies because they're both offering alternatives to the kind of money we have today. So everybody knows what gold is. Everybody knows what Bitcoin is. Well, the details are somewhat mysterious, but you might not be as familiar with the term fiat money, but fiat money is just a name for the kind of money we have today. So it's money by decree. Back when God spoke Latin, he said, fiat lux, let there be light. Uh, and this is money just by the government saying it's money. So there's a $100 bill back when the dollar was redeemable for gold. It says it has a little contract on it. We'll pay the bearer on demand $100. What did that mean? It meant they will pay you in gold coin $100 because gold defined what a dollar was. When it became no longer allowed that you could redeem your Federal Reserve note for gold, they changed on the face of the note. So where it used to say, we'll pay the bearer on demand, now it just says, ribbon, 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 $100. Right? What makes it $100? Not because it's redeemable for $100 in gold coin, but it just is $100. That's the decree. That's a fiat money. Uh, how did we get here? Why do we have fiat money? Why do we have central banks? Not because the market failed to provide us with good money, but rather because the gold standard was a constraint on governments. And they decided to replace gold as the backing for their money with something that was easier to come by, namely nothing. That saves a lot of trouble if you want to print money to fight the First World War. And that's when the gold standard was abandoned and never quite reinstated. Although after the first, sorry, after the Second World War under the Bretton Woods standard, the US dollar was redeemable for gold, not for US citizens, but for foreign central banks. And that system broke down in 1971. And since then, we've been on a in a regime across the world of fiat monies. Uh, it was possible for governments to take the economy off the gold standard once people became accustomed to using not gold coins themselves, but paper money that was a redeemable claim to gold. But there's a, there's a subtle step First, you have to monopolize the issue of these claims. So central banks were created that initially didn't have a monopoly in currency issuer, is, issue, but then they were given a monopoly. So they were the only issuer of paper money. And once that was the case, they could decide, we're going to stop redeeming today. And their customers had nowhere else to go. There was no other kind of convenient money. In the United States, we combined this suspension of the gold standard together with a law making it illegal to own gold coins. So everybody had to turn in their gold uh, to the central bank. And so the alternative of continuing to use gold coins was taken away. Guatemala actually uh, gave the central bank a... Uh, monopoly in note issue a little before the U.S. The U.S. had private note issue up until the 30s in Guatemala in 1926. The law was passed in 25. 26 is when the Central Bank of Guatemala was given a monopoly on issuing notes. Uh, anybody who's looking for a 
research topic, look into the debate. Because if you read the, I haven't actually done this, but I'm guessing, if you read the, this is typical, if you read the website of a central bank anywhere in the world, they'll tell you it was inevitable that the issue of currency had to be centrally controlled. But everywhere there was in fact a debate because a lot of people weren't convinced. They thought the system they had worked pretty well. So go back to the, when this law was passed and you'll see that people were, I predict, <laughs> people were offering good arguments for not centralizing the note issue. Because when you centralize the note issue, you just have a single point of failure. And that point of failure is the government. And when they decide that the, it's no longer convenient to observe the contractual obligation to redeem because it stops them from printing as much money, then you go off the gold standard. So that's a danger of having a single point of failure like that. Well, in principle, uh, a fiat system can work quite well. And when I say in principle, I mean on the blackboard. So lots of economists have theories about how you should, how we, we the philosopher kings, should control the issue of money to make it behave in a nice way. In practice is a different story. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with the maxim that uh, although there's no difference between theory and practice in theory, in practice there is. So how have fiat money's actually been doing? Well, here's uh, the inflation rate in the US since 2000, and for a while it was fluctuating moderately between one and a half percent and 5%. We actually had a brief period of deflation uh, during the financial crisis. But then uh, we had a big spike in 2022. And it's not just due to the pandemic, it's due to the way the Federal Reserve responded to the pandemic, which was to print a lot of money. Uh, and printing a lot of money in one way was appropriate because people were hoarding lots of money. But when the hoarding was over, the Federal Reserve, if it wanted to avoid high inflation, 9% inflation at the peak, needed to pull the extra money back and they didn't do that. They're doing it belatedly. Um, in the United Kingdom, similarly, Big run up in inflation in 2021, 2022. Likewise, the euro, over 10% inflation in, euro, uh, in Europe. The European Central Bank is supposed to have a single goal, which is 2% inflation or less. They've missed it by a wide margin and they've been very slow about correcting the mistake. So, this is kind of sad because the European Central Bank was the last great hope for fiat money. <laughs> they had a, an explicit constitution that says we have one goal and our one goal is price stability, that is a stable purchasing power of money. And by stable they meant it only falls at 2% a year. But it isn't really a very strong constraint if they can go up to 10% and take their sweet time correcting the mistake. Uh, for Guatemala, I'm told that it was 9% at some points last year, but according to, for the year as a whole, the Federal Reserve Economic Database tells me it was only about 6%. So I would expect it to be similar to US inflation because the exchange rate is doesn't move around that much. So here's the exchange rate between the quetzal and the dollar. And it's stayed in this pretty narrow band since 2018. Uh, so if a quetzal is worth the same number of dollars, or to put it the other way around, it takes one dollar is worth the same number of quetzals, 
more or less, then you should have the same inflation as the U.S. Right? Because they should both have the same purchasing power against goods and services if the exchange rate between the two currencies isn't changing. Why did we have high inflation? Money printer go burr. <laughs> that was the story uh, in response to the pandemic. Now, I'm complaining about 9 and 10 percent inflation, but some countries have it a lot worse. These are countries where it's just completely impossible to say that fiat money has been be, uh, been produced in a responsible way. So inflation rates above 30%, inflation rates in triple digits. Uh, of course, Venezuela in 2022 was down off of their peak hyperinflation years. Uh, so some other countries are moving up. Uh, so in these countries, it's, it's been a disaster. Uh, dealing with triple digit inflation is a real headache. It deranges price, relative prices. It means people spend a lot of their time just trying to keep their money balances very small. So they make a lot of trips to the bank to keep their money balances low. Uh, there's a lot of confusion generated by this kind of inflation. Well, that's one year. If we take a, a longer historical perspective, and that's done in a paper by Rolnick and Weber, and I take this graph from a working paper version before it was published. It's, for some reason, this graph didn't make it into the published version. So they looked across many countries over long periods of time and asked, did they have a higher inflation rate when they were on the gold or silver standard, or have they had a higher inflation rate under fiat money? And the answer is, for every single country, higher inflation under fiat money. So it's not just an accident that inflation has been higher under fiat money, or not just bad luck that a country has higher inflation under fiat money. It's chronic. It's systemic. It's built into the incentives that come from having no constraint on the issue of money and having the issue of money being a source of revenue or a source of uh, reducing unemployment in the short run. So the averages, average performance they came up with over this sample of countries was 1% inflation under gold or silver standards, 13% under fiat money standards, and that's leaving out the German hyperinflation of the 20s because you throw in a million percent inflation, it kind of skews your average. Uh, so this is the problem with fiat money, high inflation. Not just high inflation, but unpredictable inflation. So what do we do about this problem? There have been kind of two ways of thinking about it that different economists have developed over the years. Going back to the 1970s when we got double-digit inflation in the United States and in Great Britain and in most of Europe. Uh, one approach is to say, OK, we have a central bank. Let's give it a better set of instructions. And the strong version of that is, let's constrain it with rules that dictate to the central bank, here's what you have to do. And implicit in those rules is, you don't get to print as much money as the government asks you to print. Uh, you're restricted to something responsible. And a famous article in that tradition is by uh, Kidland and Prescott. They won a Nobel Prize in economics, mostly for this paper, or at least half for this paper. They had one other famous paper. But there's a second way to approach the problem, uh, and that's Hayek's way. And I know there are a few things named after Hayek around here, so I'm sure you've heard of him. <laughs> so. After he won the Nobel Prize in 1974, Hayek had not written about money for decades, but now he could get an audience. So he said, well, I've been thinking about this. Uh, I didn't think anybody wanted to hear from me, but now I've got more respect. 
here's the problem. We have low quality money. Why Our money's gotten terrible, double digit inflation. Why is the quality so low? Well, why isn't the quality of all goods and services low? Because we have competitive markets. People can switch from a low quality product to a high quality product. If you don't like one brand, switch to a different brand. We don't have that in money. In money, we, the government has a monopoly. There's only one fiat money in each country. And so it can be lousy, and they still don't lose customers because there's nowhere to switch to. So Hayek's first proposal was countries uh, should let their citizens use whatever money they want, whether it's from another country or their home country or gold. Let them use whatever money they want, and then they can have a way to get away from inflation or from bad quality money. And that will give incentives to the central bank to produce better quality money. Right? So that's, that was his first proposal. And then he thought some more and said, we don't just have to have a competition among central banks. Let's let private entrepreneurs into this competition. And that's when it becomes the denationalization of money. Let's take money back out of the hands of governments, back into the private sector. And I should say the first chapter of, of the book I'm trying to sell here <laughs> is about the history of private money production, because a lot of economists are unaware of it. They just take it for granted that money is one of those things that government has to produce. Uh, just based on historical myths or just based on lack of information about the history. Well, this argument that we should open up competition and that will give us better money, that's become more relevant than ever because we have new entrants into this competition, not just government fiat monies and an old-fashioned gold standard, but cryptocurrencies, the leading one, of course, is Bitcoin. I updated this number yesterday. The total amount of Bitcoin in circulation is worth more than half a trillion dollars, about 560 billion. Uh, there are roughly 20 million coins in circulation, and there will only ever be 21 million in circulation. So 95% of all the Bitcoin has already been issued that will ever be issued. It's currently selling at about a little bit below 30,000 per Bitcoin. So multiply those two and it's worth a little less than 600 billion. There are other cryptocurrencies, but none of them was really launched with the purpose of providing an alternative money. If you go back, as I do in the book, and look through what Satoshi Nakamoto the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, wrote about why he was launching this project, two main complaints. One, we rely on governments for good quality money and they've let us down time and again. Secondly, our monetary system provide, uh, allows too much surveillance of what people are doing with their money. So we want a system that's more private and we want a system that's nobody can interfere with, nobody can overissue and drive the value down. But kind of on the coattails of Bitcoin and the technology of distributed ledgers, the, the blockchain that it introduced, gold is now available on blockchains, which means that it's very easy to buy and sell gold now. When you buy and sell Tether Gold or Pax Gold, they don't ship you a, a physical piece of gold. You get ownership of a claim to gold that's in a warehouse in Switzerland. So you do have to trust them that the gold is really in the warehouse in Switzerland. But so far, these have both tracked the price of gold. Uh, so you can buy and sell them as though you were buying and selling gold without the hassle. There are also, of course, exchange-traded funds of gold, which serve the same purpose. 
And there have been some entrepreneurs introducing gold-denominated payment accounts that where you buy in and sell out without doing it through a crypto exchange. So they're more like gold-based banks. Glint is just one of many. Now, so far, uh, we don't see a lot of people putting themselves back on the gold standard or adopting Bitcoin as a way of making payments. Nobody pays their rent in Bitcoin. I used to say that I've never met anybody who has his salary paid in Bitcoin, and then I met somebody who works for the Bitcoin Foundation. Uh, but you do get people putting themselves on a better money in really extreme circumstances, like the Venezuelan hyperinflation. So in Venezuela, a couple of years ago, this is 2021, I don't know if it's how much it's still going on, there are areas of Venezuela where people were buying and selling using physical flakes of gold. It was the gold mining region, so these were available. And people were a little bit familiar with them. So the banknote here, the Bolivar, 500 Bolivars is worth nothing. It's just being used as a wrapper. <laughs> it, what's valuable is the gold that's uh, being wrapped up in it. And ordinary stores have scales to weigh the gold. And the prices are posted in grams of gold. And these areas have put themselves back on the gold standard. So. These press accounts say that something like two-thirds of the sales are in gold. Meanwhile, in, in the cities, uh, people are buying and selling, or people are earning an income in Bitcoin, and then either spending the Bitcoin to buy what they wanted to consume, or selling it on local exchanges to get just enough local currency to buy fruits and vegetables. But People were using Bitcoin for ordinary transactions, not something we see most places. Most places, people owning Bitcoin are just holding it as a speculation, hoping that as an investment, hoping that it'll go up. Okay, so let me talk about the contrast between Bitcoin and gold, because Bitcoin has sometimes been called electronic gold. And maybe if you're thinking about them as investments, how do I diversify my portfolio so it's not just denominated in fiat money, then they are, do have some similar properties. They're both inflation hedges. But they're very different when it comes to how they're supplied, what the mechanism is for changing the supply. Uh, so Bitcoin, unlike claims to gold, are not redeemable. Nobody guarantees to give you anything of any particular amount for your Bitcoin. It doesn't have any non-monetary use, unlike gold, so there's no intrinsic value. Uh, nobody assures you that it's going to be worth a certain amount. It actually doesn't exist in a physical form, it's just ledger entries. And so it's easy to transfer, because you don't have to lug anything around, and you don't have to rely on any central depository to make your transactions for you. And this is actually the biggest uh, use case for Bitcoin, the fact that it has its own payment system. So if you transfer Bitcoin to somebody, you're not using a bank, you're not using a central bank. And so this is probably the most important use of Bitcoin. It's not an everyday medium of exchange. People don't buy groceries or coffee in Bitcoin, with some exceptions, but that's extremely rare. But if you want to send money to, let's say, a dissident group in Belarus, where the government quashes down on dissent, you can't wire them dollars they will never arrive. The government doesn't allow these groups to have bank accounts or to receive transfers from the rest of the world. But you can send them Bitcoin, because the, it's hard to stop by the Belarusian government. Uh, so it's a censorship-resistant way of sending 
value. Now, the way Bitcoin is supplied uh, is different from a gold standard. I'll talk about a gold standard in a second, but Bitcoin just has a fixed release schedule. That is, it's built into the program, which anybody can go online and look at, how many Bitcoin will be in circulation at each date now and in the future. It's not exactly precise because it depends on how rapidly the validation process works, which has a slight bit of randomness in it, but it keeps correcting itself so that we can predict fairly accurately within 1% how many Bitcoin there are going to be at any time. Uh, and we know that the maximum number of Bitcoin will never be more than 21 million. And so it uses a different kind of mechanism for assuring people that it won't be inflated. Not that we promise that the inflation rate won't, won't go above 2%, promise that, of course, fiat monies are broken. Instead, the promise is there will ev never be more than 21 million Bitcoin, and between here and now and then, we know the path that Bitcoin is on. Uh, so it's like a numbered art print where they convince you that you don't have to worry about you know, paying $500 for this Andy Warhol print because, look, it's one of 300. There will never be more than 300 issued. So you can expect that it will go up in value. Uh, we're not going to issue more if it does go up in value. Um, now, the program that runs Bitcoin can be amended, and some small bug fixes have been made, but to amend it requires consensus among all the Bitcoin miners, and that's very hard to come by. So it's protected by game theory, you might say. It's not in the interest of any of these miners to kill the goose that lays the Bitcoin eggs. It turns out that uh, some of the inspiration for Bitcoin came from the, the people who were in the community where it emerged, the cypherpunk community, being familiar with the idea of private money in the form of gold-based free banking. So that's what I was writing about in the 1980s. And so before there was Bitcoin, I had some interactions with the people who are the leading suspects to be Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, little did I know, but there weren't many of us working on the idea of private competitive currency. Uh, me and my co-author, George Selgin. But in this uh, community of people who are interested in cryptography as a way of securing privacy, this idea of having a private money that could be traded pseudonymously, thereby preserving financial freedom. Uh, there was Nick Zabo and Hal Finney. Um, and so I came in touch with these people. Uh, I didn't really foresee what they were going to do. <laughs> so. I had written a paper that noted that you could use this idea of limiting the quantity to assure people that you're not going to inflate the money. But it didn't seem to me that that would be a winning design because that leaves the value free to fluctuate. It doesn't guarantee you a predictable, stable purchasing power for the money. And so maybe my prediction hasn't been falsified yet because Bitcoin isn't a commonly used medium of exchange. But I didn't foresee even a crypto asset becoming worth half a trillion dollars based on this kind of model. Uh, so no, I did not get rich buying Bitcoin early on. <laughs> but I had a theoretical reason. <laughs> Uh, but I did have an exchange with Hal Finney uh, in a, this obscure libertarian magazine called Extropy. Extropy is the opposite of entropy. 
extropy is everything gets better over time. So these are libertarian futurists who are optimistic about the future. And so Finney described Bitcoin as a token whose production rate is predictable and can't be influenced by corrupt parties. This would be analogous to gold. Right? So under a gold standard, the production of new units of gold is not up to the government. It's up to the gold mining industry, which can be private and competitive and decentralized. Uh, so there's no one person in charge. It's rather market forces that determine how much gold is going to be created. Uh, so Finney cited Zabo's idea, which Zabo called bit gold. And Zabo gave me and George Selgin some credit for uh, the idea of a, of a private currency on the model, model of a gold standard with a, a supply that's limited by market forces. In place of market forces, Bitcoin substitutes a program. So it's predictable what the quantity of Bitcoin is going to be, not because the cost of extracting it from the earth is predictable, like with a gold standard, but because the program makes it that way. Uh, all right. Now, some other economists have had trouble wrapping their heads around Bitcoin. So as I said, one purpose in writing the book was to explain Bitcoin to gold bugs and to explain the gold standard to Bitcoiners. But uh, here's John Cochran, who I normally agree with, but here's what he says about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a pure fiat money whose value comes from limited supply plus demands. And then in the very same paragraph, it's an electronic version of gold. Well, now which is it? <laughs> you can't be a fiat money and be a version of gold, because the whole thing about gold is that the quantity is not issued by government, it's decentralized. Uh, and, but the reason he says that is that he thinks under a gold standard the quantity of money is very fixed, at least in the short term, so that you get big spikes in the value. And that's been the experience with gold since it was demonetized. That is, the price has become volatile because people speculate now in gold. They buy it as an inflation hedge and they sell it when it doesn't look like, when interest rates go up and they can make more money some other way. But that's not how gold behaved when it was money. If you look at the behavior of the purchasing power of the dollar or the British pound when they represented fixed weights of gold, it's pretty stable. It's almost exactly the same over 30, 50, 100 year horizons. There is some fluctuation in between, but it reverses itself. If the purchasing power starts to sag, or if the value of gold against goods and services goes down, that discourages gold mining. But that means the supply becomes more limited, and that makes the value go back up to where in equilibrium, the value of an ounce of gold has to be equal to the value, of the cost of producing an ounce of gold. Uh, so it's not true that Bitcoin should be a warning to those who long for a return to gold. All right, so again, they're supplied by very different mechanisms. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen supply and demand diagrams, show of hands. Okay, I'll try to be gentle. All right, so the upward sloping curve is the supply curve. The downward sloping curve is the demand curve, meaning how many units people want to own at various PPG as purchasing power of gold, which you would measure by asking how many bundles of goods do you get for an ounce of gold. So we have an initial place where the quantity demanded, shown on the demand curve, equals the quantity supplied, shown on the supply curve. There's one purchasing power of gold that clears the market. Uh, that's the intersection point to the left. And then suppose there's a big increase in the demand for gold. Suppose, I don't know, Germany gets off the silver standard and joins the gold standard. 
it does drive up the purchasing power of gold in the short run. But that's not the end of the story, because now the value of gold as a medium of exchange exceeds the cost of getting it out of the ground. Let's assume the cost of mining gold hasn't changed. Now it's more profitable to mine gold. You can buy more with each ounce you mine. So the gold miners are going to dig a little deeper. They're going to produce more ounces per year. Those additional ounces, nobody's demanding them for industrial purposes. The miners can always take them to the mint. And that means that the money supply is going to start rising. And as it grows, that means the supply curve is shifting to the right. At any purchasing power of gold, there are now more units available. And that, the dotted line, that's going to drive the purchasing power of gold back down to where we're back in a long-run equilibrium, where, again, the purchasing power of gold equals the cost of extracting and producing the gold. Uh, so that's the, the self-stabilizing property of a gold standard in response to changes in the demand for monetary gold, or in response to one-time changes in the stock of monetary gold. An implication is that, suppose the economy is growing, and that's why the demand for gold is rising. People just want more money because they're earning more income, and they want to make more transactions. So there's a bigger transactions demand for gold. If more gold wasn't mined every year, what would happen? The purchasing power of gold would keep going up. But that can't be, that can't persist, because the higher the purchasing power of gold, the more temptation there is, the more incentive there is to dig deeper, to send out more prospectors, to come up with better ways to extract gold from low quality ore. And those things are going to mean that the number of ounces produced every year is going to go up. And here's some empirical evidence that that actually happened. Between 1807 and 1870, well, I've got two different spans of dates, because one is numbers on the gold stock of monetary gold, the best estimates I could find. And the other is the real output of the economy. All right, so gold stock is how many ounces are being added to the world stock every year. In the first period, output is growing at about 2% a year. So roughly, people want 2% more money. And the gold industry is producing 2% growth in the stock of gold every year. After 1870, Basically, the Industrial Revolution goes into high gear. Output starts growing faster at about 2.5% a year. If output was growing at 25 and the gold stock was still only growing at 2%, you'd have the mismatch I just talked about and a perpetually rising purchasing power of gold. But the gold mines responded to that incentive, and the output of gold started growing so that the stock of gold grew at 2.5% a year instead of 2%. So, bottom line, it's not a coincidence that the purchasing power of gold was stable over periods, because if it got out of line, market forces would bring it back in. If the purchasing power of gold goes up, more gold gets produced and brings it back down. So it's not an accident, as some economists have imagined, that the purchasing power of gold was stable over long periods. It's built into the mechanism for supplying gold. But here's Bitcoin. Here's the scheduled quantity of Bitcoin measured in how many blocks. These are groups of transactions uh, have been processed so far. But this is actually a time scale because Bitcoin is programmed to produce a new block every 10 seconds. So this red dot is where we are now. Uh, Bitcoin is currently on a segment of the growth path. So the upward sloping curve shows you how many Bitcoin measured in millions. The downward sloping curve shows you the growth rate. So in the very early years, Bitcoin was growing the supply was growing more than 100% a year, because 
right? The first block produced 50 bitcoins. The second block produced 50 bitcoins. Wow, the supply just doubled. Uh, but that was happening every 10 seconds. So enormous growth early on. Then it comes down into moderate ranges. And it's programmed to cut, be cut in half roughly every four years. So we're currently at this segment where it's growing at a little less than 2%. But that's going to keep slowing down. And then in 2040, it's going to max out at 21 million units. So this is very different because when the price of Bitcoin goes up, what happens to the quantity produced? Nothing. It does change incentives to be a, gold, a Bitcoin miner, sorry, a Bitcoin miner. But calling the, uh, because if, if you, being a miner means you enter the validation process. You enter the contest to solve the math problem that enables you to sort of win the race, uh, the proof of work race. Some of you may be familiar with this jargon. So there are more contestants, but the prize doesn't get any bigger. There's no increase in the rate at which new Bitcoin is introduced. There's just more competition to be the recipient of the new units. All right, so now I can compare Bitcoin and gold standard head to head. Economists would say the supply of Bitcoin is vertical. The supply curve for Bitcoin is vertical. That is, it doesn't vary at all depending on what the price or the purchasing power is doing. It's just fixed. And that means that if there's an increase in demand, the price goes up a lot because there's no other way to adjust. There's no change in the quantity. All the burden of adjustment falls on the price. Whereas with gold, in the short run, it's not vertical because you can convert non-monetary gold into monetary gold. People melt down their jewelry when the price of gold gets high because there are other things they'd rather have. And they can buy a lot more now with the gold that they have already at hand. Melt it down, coin it, and go out and buy something else. But so in the short run, there's a small difference. The price of gold doesn't fluctuate as much. Right? The vertical distance it, the price travels is smaller in the case of gold than in the case of Bitcoin. But in the long run, it's really dramatic. Because in the long run, if the cost of extracting gold doesn't change, then the purchasing power of gold keeps returning to that level. It's a flat long run supply curve. And changes in the demand for money are absorbed by more gold being issued, more gold being mined and produced in, in monetary form, and not by a change in the purchasing power of gold. Right? So this explains why the price level is pretty constant over the long historical track record of the classical gold standard, whereas the supply curve for Bitcoin is still vertical. So as a result of that, you get big variations in the price of Bitcoin. All right, so to summarize in words uh, and put some numbers on it, the stock of gold grew pretty slowly on average. We saw that it was about 2% during one period and about 2.5% during another period. Uh, Hugh Rockoff estimates that over this period he looks at, it grew at 2.9% a year. Uh, but that rate was not constant. It varied depending on the purchasing power of gold. It would, mining would go up when gold was valuable and go down when gold was less valuable. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is growing at a pre-programmed rate. And that means that purchasing power volatility is built into the design of Bitcoin. So if you uh, have Bitcoin price alerts on your phone, this is what you see. Up 5.5% in the last 22 hours, down 5% in the last 7 hours, up 6.88% in the last 8 hours. This is why you turn these alerts off, because they'll drive you crazy. But here's a chart. 
showing how the price, uh, how the volatility of Bitcoin compares to the volatility of other financial assets. So over 60 days, how much movement is there in the price? And Bitcoin moves 8.23%, whereas dollar value of gold, this is the dollar value of Bitcoin, the dollar value of gold, less than a fourth of that, only 1.73%. And the exchange rate between the euro and the US dollar, 1.28%. So even demonetized, the purchasing power of gold is not much more volatile than uh, the purchasing power of two fiat monies compared to each other. If you look at daily price movements, Bitcoin are the red spikes. <laughs> Everything else are the blue lines in the middle. OK. So where does this leave us? Uh, We've got fiat monies. They sometimes, in some places, they chronically perform badly. Even in the United States and Europe and high income countries where inflation hasn't been that bad, it sometimes gets bad, sometimes gets into double digits. So can we expect gold or Bitcoin to replace fiat money by being more reliable? Well, there are a couple of problems. One is that there are legal restrictions against using gold or Bitcoin. They're not allowed into the banking system. They face tax disadvantages. Any change in the price of Bitcoin is a taxable event for people who own Bitcoin. Uh, if they sell it, they have to pay taxes on the capital gain. But secondly, there's a great network effect in money. So the founder of the Austrian school, Karl Menger, talked about how people converge on a common money because everybody wants to make their own lives as easy as possible. So when you're looking for trading partners, you want to trade with people who will accept the money that uh, is easy for you to come by. Or to put it the other way, you're more inclined to use something as a medium of exchange the more other people you can trade with. You want to be paid in something that you can turn around and spend with a lot of people and not just with a handful of people. And so people on the lookout for what will serve their purposes when they sell their goods, they want to acquire something that's easy to spend in, with a wide variety of spenders, sorry, wide variety of sellers, will be on the lookout for what's a popular medium of exchange. And so the popularity becomes self-reinforcing. That's a network effect. Or to put it another way, once a money is established, it, it's an incumbent. It has a big advantage by being the one that everybody expects to be paid in and everybody expects to be able to spend. Now, I don't want to overstate the importance of incumbency. We do see money's being dislodged when they perform badly. So in Venezuela, nobody uses the Bolivar if they can help it. In Ecuador, in 1999, when inflation started to approach really high numbers, everybody switched to using the dollar. And eventually the government gave up trying to keep the Sucre in circulation and said, okay, we're switching to dollars too. Right, so people will put themselves on a different money if the incumbent money is bad enough. Uh, the new money they switch to is one that has lower inflation, probably no worse volatility, better, yeah, lower volatility is better, and is one that you can spend. So in Ecuador, they dollarized because they had a lot of trade with the United States. So the dollar has been the number one alternative in high inflation countries, uh, not just in Latin America. In Lebanon, it's the number one currency now. Something like 90% of all transactions are in dollars in Lebanon. But what, uh, what we observe in these cases is it takes a fairly high rate of inflation to get people to switch. And so I don't expect a gold standard to reemerge from the bottom up, or a Bitcoin standard as the money that denominates people's transactions. 
until there's high inflation in the major fiat monies, persistently high inflation. And I don't know how likely that is. I mean, we've, we just had an episode of double digit inflation again. If there is a case, if it does come to pass that the fiat monies break down, I'm predicting that gold is more likely to be adopted than Bitcoin because it's less volatile, uh, because of its supply mechanism. Secondly, it, it has more users now than Bitcoin does. If you look at the value of all the monetary gold held by the public, uh, well, if you look at all the gold above ground, it's 11 trillion. If you just look at the gold that's in monetary form right now, that is coins, bullion, exchange-traded funds, it's about, uh, oh, and central bank reserves, it's about four and a half trillion. So that's nine times as much as the value in Bitcoin. Bitcoin proponents, uh, there's some people who wanted Bitcoin to succeed as the world's money. They sometimes tell me, look, uh, okay, it's volatile now, but that's gonna go down as adoption becomes more widespread. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be true. There hasn't been any reduction in its volatility as it's gone from you know, one dollar per Bitcoin to 30,000 per Bitcoin. Uh, and the design hasn't changed, which means the volatility is still built in. The supply doesn't respond, and the demand is mostly speculative demand, so it's volatile. So for those reasons, I think a gold standard is more likely to reemerge. But let me end on a more optimistic note. <laughs> there are other possibilities. So cryptocurrencies are not limited to the Bitcoin design where the quantity is fixed or predetermined. Uh, there's a new kind of design which has gotten the name Flatcoin because its purchasing power is supposed to be flat. So it follows the price index. Uh, so stable coins, you may have heard of, stable coins are fixed to a fiat money or to gold. But a flat coin adjusts for inflation. These are ample forth and spot are two examples. They're still pretty experimental. They work through a pegging mechanism, but it's an adjustable peg. There's another, prob uh, another possibility, which is to design a cryptocurrency that works like the classical gold standard did with the flat long run supply elasticity, flat long run supply curve. And disclaimer, I'm advising a team that's working on a currency like this. The name is Prasaga. I'm not trying to sell it here. <laughs> this is neither a solicitation to buy nor an offer to sell. In fact, it's not available yet. It's gonna be rolled out in a few months. Uh, but the problem is that we're trying to solve is to write a program so it's but a program that allows the quantity to be responsive to demand. Right? So supply elasticity is built into the program. Uh, with, in other words, there needs to be an, uh, a data feed to the program that tells it what the price of the currency is and what the price level is it, uh, measured in dollars, let's say. And then the supply is adjusted to that. So who knows, it's, it's an uphill battle to uh, get any new currency into circulation because you need to a acquire a critical mass. But one source of, well, this wasn't a source of inspiration, actually. I only discovered this quote after the fact. But Vitalik Buterin, who designed Ethereum, way back in 2014, said, look, the, the Bitcoin people think that it's going to become the world's money, but look, it's got a fixed supply, and that means that the price is too volatile to ever be a stable unit of account. That is a unit for denominating prices. Prices are going to fluctuate. 
I think the best route to a cryptocurrency price stability is by experimenting with intelligently designed flexible monetary policies, which is what we're trying to do with Prasaga. But all of these new designs have to be tested in the market. So here's Nick Zabo saying, we can only settle questions about what people want and what technologies work by putting them out there and seeing how they do. Uh, so policy conclusions, we need to, if we want to have a discovery process, we need to open the field. We need to take down the legal barriers, as Hayek proposed long ago, uh, and the tax disadvantages on alternative currencies. As long as fiat money is relevant, we do need to worry about limiting its supply so that we don't get spikes in inflation. But I got a book on that, too. Well, I helped edit a book. Uh, we need a monetary constitution, that is, we need to think about how to design sensible rules so that central banks don't get out of hand. And I will end here, and in case I said anything controversial, take questions. Thank you.